Good afternoon. This is Gareth Aiden, and I'm here for the Historical Committee of the Nashville Bar Association and its Oral History Project to um, take the oral history interview of George Crawford, Jr., who is not only my law partner and a good friend, but a well-respected Nashville attorney. George, if you will, let's start just with your full name, please, sir. George Vincent Crawford, Jr. And I believe you were born in Miami, and what's the date, please, sir? May 22nd, 1940. Tell us a little bit, please, about who your dad was and what he did. Well, my dad uh, was born in New York, and his family moved to Miami in the early 20s. And he had his full-time career with Florida Power and Light, the utility company there. He started out there as a grunt, as they call it, and moved on to be an officer in the company and retired at age 65. And tell us a little bit about your mother. My mother was Winnell Crawford, and she was born... Um, several years after him in Atlanta, Georgia, and her family moved to Miami about the same time. And I think you told me that, um, that your dad had started uh, in college, but because of financial situations, had to go to work and began with a utility company and rose to a very high position. Yes, he uh, had started at Rutgers on a swimming scholarship, but because it was times when they're difficult for a lot of families. He had to go back and help the family um, survive the economic downturn. Tell me a little bit about your early childhood before you started school. What was it like growing up in Miami? Well, contrary to what people may believe today, it was a very small community. As, as I've said, I could ride my bike all over town with my dogs and not have to worry about a thing. If I did that today, it would not work out too well. <laughs> Did you go to um, elementary school in Miami? Yes, went to Carl Gables Elementary, then on to Ponce de Leon Junior High, and then the high school, Carl Gables Senior High. How large was Carl Gables Senior High School? Well, actually, my, my class graduated 1,000 people, larger than what my undergraduate school was at Vanderbilt. Well, what... Um, what did you do during high school? Were you a pretty good student? Pretty good student, yeah. And um, I was involved in student government, uh, played some sports, mainly football, and um, had a, I was a good experience, really was. You mentioned school government, and I think that's something I'd like to take a minute to talk about because it sort of, I think, played a part in the direction of your career. Um, what did you do with school government? It was pretty extraordinary, as I recall. Well, I don't know if it's extraordinary, but I was uh, elected uh, to president of the class of each year, starting in seventh grade, going through all of junior high, and then in high school, I was the president of the uh, sophomore class, and I became student council president uh, my senior year. And then did you also do some work outside of there in an organization or was... There was an organization called the Student Council Association for the State of Florida and our school was elected, which meant I was going to be president of that association for the state. George, you mentioned football and as I recall, there was an incredible incidence where your Carl Gables team played a Tennessee team. Well, didn't play them, but uh, my junior year they were undefeated. Uh, and they were, they being some other schools, were looking for a, a, a school to play because they'd beaten everybody in, in, in Florida. And one of them that came up, it never happened, one of them that came up was Montgomery Bell Academy. <laughs> and that's where your son ended up going to school. <laughs> yeah, but they never heard of the Carl Gable Senior High because it never happened. But they were a good team, and NBA at that time was very good as well. Um. Other things that you did during your childhood, I think you were a Boy Scout and became an Eagle Scout. Is yes, that that's right. What about um, living by the ocean? Did you take advantage of that? Yes, thanks to my father, I took advantage at a very young age. We did a lot of sailing. I started sailing and learning how to sail when I was six years old. 
and then continue to sail and race uh, all the way through high school and then in to some degree into college and, and sailed in the ocean races uh, at a very young age. You, you sailed in ocean races yes. while you were still in, in high school? Junior high. Really? Yeah. Tell us about some of those. Well, my dad did a lot of sailing. That was his advocation. And um, I was fortunate enough to be able to sail as a crew on a boat called the Malabar 13. And some of those races included the Miami to Nassau race uh, and then the St. Petersburg to Havana, Cuba, before Castro was there. <laughs> At the risk of getting a little bit ahead, did you also do some sailing when you were college age? Yes, I got to sail uh, in the World's Cup for Lightnings, and that took place in Milford, Connecticut. They had 10, 10 teams from the United States and the rest of them from around the world. When you weren't going to school um, during your high school years, did you work? Yes. Um, my f family was a, a modest family, but uh, we knew if we were going to go to college, we had to help, and so we started at an early age doing all sorts of odd jobs, primarily uh, bagging groceries, um, mowing yards, and eventually, when I got old enough, I worked in some manufacturing companies. As you went through high school, um, what, what classes did you seem to like the best? Well, I enjoyed history and English, and uh, those were my main two that I think I enjoyed in the uh, in high school, and we had some excellent teachers at our high school. We had a remarkable public school for that time. Right. I think, um, did you have two sisters? I did. And Tell then, us a little bit about them before we get away from your childhood. Well, I had an older sister. She was almost three years older than I was, and my younger sister was five years younger than I was. Um, again, another strong woman in my life. Um, my younger sister and her husband have now moved to Nashville. My older sister is, um, her husband passed away a few years ago and they live in Texas, Dallas, Texas area. As you, um, as you became a senior and started looking ahead, uh, and I know you had been working to try to save money for college, where did you decide to apply? Well, it's interesting. The person uh, that was counsel to Florida Power and Light, where my father was an employee, was originally from Nashville and he had gone to Vanderbilt and Harvard, and he wanted me to apply to Vanderbilt. Not knowing much about Vanderbilt, and not many students were from Nashville, uh, were from Miami, I um, did apply, got accepted, and uh, there were some other schools that we'd been accepted at. One was Emory, and the problem is with that, 70 of my classmates from high school were gonna go to Emory. And I decided I just didn't really want to re, uh, re, re, renew my experience with those folks in, in college. So I think in, uh, in about 1958, you came to Nashville I did. for Vanderbilt. Didn't, right, didn't speak a Southern accent at that time, and I had to learn the colloquial expressions, as we know. And I had to learn that when they said, come by and see, they really meant for you to call first. So I learned that <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> How did you like Vanderbilt? It was a great experience. I was very blessed to have um, four good years there in undergraduate school and actually um, uh, had a, got to know the people in Nashville and it, I really came to enjoy it. not only Vanderbilt but Nashville. It was good, good people. Did, um, did you join a fraternity? Joined Phi Delta Theta. Um, um, I was the only one from Florida at that time in my class and uh, that was a good experience. I am one of the few people that asked how much it cost though. <laughs> In terms of um, the work that you had done throughout high school and student government, did you do any work at Vanderbilt in that area? Uh, I did. I did when I got into law school, but before then, I had I had some jobs. One of them was a, a minor job. You got into the games free if you'd sell programs. I didn't tell you that earlier, but that's what I did. And I think you worked on a publications board also. Yes, I was uh, appointed to the Board of Publication, and we s sort of had the right to approve whoever was going to be employed uh, in those particular publications, one of them being the Hustler, and we approved uh, Lamar Alexander as being the person who could be the head, head person at the Hustler. So you helped the later governor of Tennessee get started? S sort of, you know. <laughs> he was doing fine <laughs> on his own. What about, um, tell us a little bit about 
your professors, and what areas of study you enjoyed the most at Vanderbilt? Uh, I majored in political science and had a double minor of history and English. And in both each of those three categories, there was a favorite professor. One in English was, uh, I think it was Walter Sullivan. He was excellent, and we had um, British American history um, novels, and he was excellent. And in, in history, I had um, Mr. Dr. Weaver, and he'd had Middle American history, was pre-Civil War and afterwards. And he was very engaging in the sense that he knew so much about the history of, of the war, and he was very ob objective about it, and having not really experienced any of, the, of that uh, uh, knowledge about that uh, the Civil War, he gave us a very interesting overview of that, especially on the battles and all the details of which I had never known. Uh, yeah. English was Walter Sullivan, as I mentioned, and he had the modern, um, as it was, middle, well, it wasn't modern, it was actually English and British novels. And he was excellent on that, just excellent. And then in, in political science, I had Dr. Harris, who went on to be dean at the Virginia Arts and Science Department. And he, um, uh, as a matter of fact, helped some of us get into a program as a, as a junior or senior, I was a junior, where we actually went to Washington and did a, a paper on the transition of uh, one administration to the other, and it was, and we got to interview some of the top people in the um, in the government or going into the government. Right. Even met, I forgot to tell you, met uh, Frankfurt and talked with Frankfurt in the Supreme Court uh, building. What an experience! It was. I take it that you were sort of following up on your interests in political science and in that area. I did enjoy that, and um, we were fortunate to have very good professors in the uh, political science and the arts and science uh, sections of the college. How were, how were your grades? Well, I was not number one in the class, but I was, uh, 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 I guess you'd say a B, B plus. Did you, um, did you enjoy the Nashville and the Vanderbilt experience in undergraduate school? I did. Uh, of course, I didn't have a car, so I was at the mercy of my fraternity brothers who had cars, and they would let us borrow them, provided we put some gas in, and for 50 cents, we got a lot of gas in at that time. What were your summers like during college? Well, I had jobs in Miami, and most of them were outdoor jobs, one, uh, primarily in the construction, and uh, they were affiliates with uh, my father's company, Florida Power and Light. I couldn't work for the company directly, but I could work for these affiliates, and usually they were um, quite educational in a non-educational way. Uh, the people we worked with were pretty tough characters, and they really didn't like college students. <laughs> but we got, to, got through it all, kept my heart at it, and always put it on my bookcase to make sure I knew I didn't want to do that for a living. <laughs> As you got toward the, uh, toward the end of your college career, and I guess this was your undergraduate career would have ended in about the spring of 1962, what, uh, what were you thinking about doing? Well, uh, collectively, my family wanted me to become a lawyer, and I had no objection to that at all. I did have some um, concerns about where I went to law school, and my parents, because of the cost, wanted me to go to University of Florida Law School which I did. And I started at University of Florida Law School for two trimesters and made a decision that I was not going to continue there. And I would have to probably go into service because that was right in the middle of Vietnam War, so, uh, and then DLA going to law school. But I wanted to come back to Vanderbilt. Right. You mentioned the service. Did you join the uh, Army Reserve? Uh, actually, the U.S. Coast Guard. That was a big thing okay. down in Miami. And I spent my recruiting uh, in, in, I guess you'd say it's a basic training in Cape May, New Jersey, and I ended up being secretary to the athletic director and in charge of the football team on away trips. We won't tell stories on those people. It was very interesting what we did, but uh, uh, I didn't have to play football, which was good because they were a lot bigger than I was. And um, after you got through with your basic training, I guess this would be in, 19, in late 1962, did you, uh, what did you do then? Well. You Actually, had sort of suspended your classes at yeah, Florida. Right, and, I, and then I was going to apply to Vanderbilt. And actually, I, it, I lost about a year and a half because between the time I went into service and then could go to law school in the fall, uh, I believe it was 1964, that I came back and interviewed with the illustrious Paul Hartman and at that time Assistant Dean John Beasley. 
did you um, take to the atmosphere at Vanderbilt Law School? Very well, much so, yes. It was, uh, they were not trying to kick you out. They wanted to make sure if you got in, you should be able to stay in. And um, I knew I was going to have to pay my own way, so uh, that was all part of my plan is to get jobs one way or the other that would help me pay for it. Well, I've heard you tell some of these stories many times, but what company did you end up working with or for that helped you get through law school? One of my fraternity brothers, a guy named Harry Moody, and he happened to be down in Miami off season and needed a place to stay. And then he talked to me about working in the uh, dictionary division, which was a new division, and he was involved in that. And as a result, um, I accepted a position. Uh, no guarantees what you make. You just had to go out there and go at it all day long. And um, we did go and sell dictionaries, primarily in Tennessee and Alabama the first summer. And um, didn't mention to you, my first job, uh, first book I sold was to a fellow sitting on a tractor with the cows flipped on. And I think the cows were paying more attention than he was. But uh, we did sell it and uh, did that for two summers and was able to, with that and a couple other jobs I had, get out of law school without any debt. That's incredible. Was it the Southwest Company Southwest that you company, worked yes. for? Known by Dorch Odom and, matter of fact, Ted Welch was there at the time, too. What classes or professors, however, you know, you would like to present it, were sort of your favorites in law school? For various reasons, I enjoyed in, in law school at Vanderbilt, um, Paul Hartman. Uh, he was qu quite an individual, and he had that phrase, that's a heck of a way to, I'm cleaning it up, that's a heck of a way to run a railroad. And uh, he had, uh, I think it was uh, state and local taxation. Uh, I had uh, E. Bly Stason, who had been, a, I think, assistant dean at Michigan, and we were into legislation and writing um, uh, current type of issues, and mine was, we had to do a dissertation on was science and the law and how it had been affected by uh, the te technology as to uh, eavesdropping and wiretapping, that sort of thing. While you were in law school, did you, um, did you begin working or have a job with, uh, with Vanderbilt in the dorms? Yes, I, one of the great things that was made available to me was to be um, assistant RA the first year and then I RA the second was a resident advisor. In my second year of it, I was a uh, head resident for the Vanderbilt football freshman team. And as we know back then, and they, the record will show, they couldn't play football worth a hoop, but they could cause all sorts of havoc in the dorm. So we uh, had that experience. But I was very fortunate to pay my room and board plus $40 a month and a discount on my cleaning. That's a wonderful thing to be able to do because that, that helped make law school financially possible. Yes, that and, and that and... Um, then also selling dictionaries for Southwestern Company. I did coach wrestling at MBA, but I'm not sure how much I really made off of that, but that was a fun, fun experience. I think I've heard several lawyers here in town say that they did dorm advising. Anybody that became a lawyer that was oh, yes. working with you? Some well-known ones. Uh, Frank Woods, of course, was uh, head resident the first year, and then I was in that dorm group. We were the advisors on it. Was, uh, uh, Bob Brand, who got, went on to, we practiced law together for a while, then he went on to be a judge. Uh, Lionel Barrett, who is well known, and of course Frank Woods. I can't remember anybody else at this time, but uh, uh, it, was, it was a good experience most of the time. <laughs> well, you're, you're rumored to have started or been a part of starting a very famous legal organization with those other dorm advisors. Something about the order of the moot. Oh, well, I was, a, I was a bystander in it, but I heard about it, and it was, it was these fellows who had, apparently had too much time on their hands, but they decided to find a law student that they wanted to have join that group, and that he was to find people in the school that might be either in it or know something about it. So this fellow would go around and go moot, moot, and people respond, moot, moot. Well, they finally told him, I think this was uh, uh, Frank Woods and, uh, and Bob Brandt, they said, no, it's not true. There is no such organization. He said, well, they kept saying moot, moot back, so I figured they were in. So they finally convinced him it didn't matter. I, later on in my life, I was my first wife who passed away was an advisor of one of the sororities at Vanderbilt, and two girls were there, and she introduced me to him being the children of this particular lawyer, and I had to say I started laughing because it was it was such a 
uh, uh, interesting time to do things like that in law school. While you were in law school, I think you met somebody that um, you would later marry. Who was this? Yes, my, my first wife who passed away about uh, 2001 was Judy Rodenhauser. She was a senior at Vanderbilt, and we met each other. And um, I think her parents may have had somebody else in mind who was from Nashville, but she found, I think they found out through one of my family friends in Miami that I was an okay guy. So we got married in my last year of law school and um, lived in the married student dorms and um, made my best grades ever. <laughs> it helped to settle down and marry, didn't <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> no TV either, so that, make, that helped us work. As you were going through law school, George, um, tell us a little bit did you congeal any plans about practicing and what type of practice you thought you would be best suited for? Well, like most young lawyers, we think we're going to, or law students, we think we're going to be trial lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about that. But then we didn't have many corporate uh, classes, but uh, one we did have I seemed to enjoy. The problem is it was primarily talking about stockholders' derivative suits, and I don't believe I've ever had one. <laughs> but it, that was an area. And... Um, uh, I just enjoyed the professors who were in that area, but primarily the ones I mentioned, they were, they were good lawyers, uh, good professors. Did you have any opportunity to do anything like clerking I while did. you were in law school? My last year, since I had to do my reserve training all at one time, which they was, these folks won't remember that, but it was a category eight, so I had to do it all at one time. So I was getting married that summer and didn't have time to have a full-time job, but I did get to work with Gil Merritt when he was just starting out as U.S. Attorney. Paid me $3 a day. <laughs> $3 a day. <laughs> and uh, any good memories from um, the period of time that you clerked for the USDA here in Nashville? Uh, whether, uh, I just remember the judge, um, most of the cases had to do with um, um, bootleggers and uh, how they got off because they were either entrapped or something was wrong with the evidence and I watched the judge and I watched the lawyers go through that process. <laughs> that must have been Judge Gray's court. It was Judge Gray and he, he uh, I didn't know him well obviously but uh, he could make, feel, make lawyers feel very uh, I would say uh, nervous about being in his court. He, uh, and he didn't mind saying what he thought on his mind, if I remember correctly. Um, in terms of the type of practice you wanted to go to, you really did you really not center on any particular type of practice? Right. I did not really have any idea. I did have an opportunity uh, to clerk for the, the Supreme Court of Tennessee, and Judge White, who I was supposed to work for, passed away. And the judge that took his place was Allison B. Humphreys, and uh, he accepted the, uh, my position. He was the biggest judge, and I was the smallest clerk. And there are some interesting stories we will not record at this time. But uh, it very bright, and uh, I learned a lot because I had not worked in law firm at all, so I really had no clue of what really went on in, in the practice of law. About how long did you, after law school graduation, did you work for Judge Humphreys on the Supreme Court? It started right after we got out. Actually, I had to start early because the fellow was clerking was going to go to Texas, and so I had to step in and take his position when I was really not planning to do it that soon. I should mention that when you had talked about working for Gil Merritt uh, while you were in law school as a clerk, he ended up being a judge on the Sixth Circuit Court yes. of Appeals. Yes. When you, uh, while you were in your year working for uh, Judge Humphreys on the Tennessee Supreme Court, did you get to travel with the court? We did. We traveled at that time, and I think they still do. Uh, we went to Jackson and Knoxville, and um, they'd have hear cases there in those those jurisdictions. Um, this would have been, let's see, you would have graduated from law school in about 1967. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So then during roughly the late 67 and, and 68, you were, you were um, working for Judge Humphreys, and then what happened? I got a call from a fellow named Frank Woods, and he had asked me would I be interested in being in corporate counsel for Lynn Broadcasting. It was a local company that owned radio and TV stations, but the condition was that I'd have to move to New York and handle their office up there, which... Um, 
when they told me what the salary was going to be, which was about twice what anybody was making in Nashville, I jumped on it because it, the condition was I got to keep that salary when I came back to Nashville. So my wife and I moved to uh, New York, lived in a very modest hotel, which is $400 a month. Now it's $600 a day the last time I checked, uh, right in Midtown, and we worked in, out of the Ford Foundation building, which was on Madison Avenue. The fellow who um, called you about this job, Frank Woods, is that the same Frank Woods who had been a classmate of yours? Well, he was a year ahead of me. He was with Bob Brandt in that group, okay. but they, he was there, so we knew each other. Right, right. Well, tell us a little bit about your year working for it. What was Lynn Broadcasting? When well, you know? they owned, at that time, they owned primarily uh, radio and TV stations. And back then, there was a limitation on how many uh, TV stations and radio stations could be owned, if I remember correctly, by any one entity. And um, fortunately, we had a nice, well-known law firm in New York uh, on, on, uh, of counsel to us. Uh, Cravath, Swain, and Moore. So if I didn't know the answers, I certainly had someone I could go to. So we, uh, primarily, they were trying to broaden their base outside the limitations they had owning real estate, I mean, at, uh, radio stations and TV stations. And one of the things they were looking at is buying some companies. One of them they wanted to buy, which we were involved in, was uh, the largest telecommunication company at that time in the United States. It was owned by a family, and so we were involved in that transaction, and it was a quite an interesting transaction because it was family owned and the family had their own ideas about running a company and also selling the company. And I think you also did work negotiating television and radio rights for yes. various... Uh, yeah. And also they were getting into movie rights and so we had the mm -hmm. great experience of representing the company on buying the licenses with the Cisco Kid International. <laughs> <laughs> did you like this business aspect of I all. did like it. Uh, I, I really did. It was uh, something I had not had any exposure to, in, of course, in law school, uh, nor before I, I went to uh, Lynn. But uh, it was a, an aggressive company, and it was sort of like we'd say today, a go-go company. And they did get into several different types of business, some of them owning the rights to TV and movies, and um, some of them were infamous type of companies. But the uh, it was it was interesting to see that whole concept of how they worked. It was completely different than what I thought about corporate work. How did your wife Judy like living in New York City? Oh, she was great. She enjoyed it and she adapted to it very well. Fortunately, she was pregnant with our first child, so she couldn't do a lot of shopping. <laughs> but we had access to the company, access to uh, the theater and uh, and and museums. Did you? Um, how did the sort of the the atmosphere of law practice in New York suit? Well, to give an example, uh, a well-known lawyer in town, James Gooch, who's with Bass Berry, were friends of mine, it was friends of mine, and still is, and he was at tech school up there. Well, I needed some help and some due diligence, and um, I think what was interesting, we were all very young, and some of the New York lawyers were dealing with them, some of these transaction officers were older, and they said, is anyone in this group over age 26? And nobody was. So it was a good experience from that standpoint. But thank goodness we did have support from uh, Gravath Swain if we needed some expert yeah. advice. Uh, toward the, uh, I guess, the end of 1969, did Lynn Broadcasting get sold? Yes, a guy named Marty Ackman, if I remember correctly, was the name. He was involved with Saturday Evening Post, and he wanted to buy the company and buy and control an interest in it which he did, and then we were offered a position to stay in New York, but we were really planning to come back to Nationals. And when you came back in late 1969, where did you go to work? Well, it was strange enough, we were offered even more money than I was surprised that I was getting with a now famous or infamous company called Mini Pearl Chicken. And I didn't know anybody working there other than I'd heard their names. And um, so we accepted that position and, and worked in that area of, uh, for several years and then. Did you have a contact that sort of got you or helped you get the job at Mini Pearl or how did that Yeah, happen? and I'm trying to remember who that was. Uh, Dan Scott, I guess his name was. Okay. Uh, he was a local fella and uh, sort of knew what was going on and uh, so we accepted it and uh, learned a little bit about franchising. To um, sort of set the historical uh, horizon for folks, who was the who who was the primary mover in Mini Pearl Fried Chicken? The one and only John J. Hooker Jr. 
And uh, did Minnie Pearl have very much to do with the business itself? Not really, although she, uh, her name was, of course, important. Uh, and they sold a lot of franchises. I was still trying to figure out how much chicken they had sold, but they hadn't sold too much that. What was your position in the legal department? I was one of the corporate counsel. Um, a fellow named G. Everett Fryer, a, a sort of a politico, was general counsel, but the assistant general counsel, associate general counsel, was Alara Carson, who was a very bright, very well-known lawyer. Right. And she ended up going with Jim Neal, if I remember correctly. Okay. Tell us a little bit about working for Mini Pearl Fried Chicken and any good stories well, you Well, one recall. I had was that, uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Mr. Hooker Sr., John Jay, and his brother Henry, as well as Minnie Pearl, uh, had a chance to sell their stock, I don't think I'm saying anything, it's not a public knowledge, uh, to National General, a corporation out of uh, California. And the deal was, if I remember correctly, they could sell it at a nice price, but they had to invest at least a portion of that money back into the franchising business, and they're going to start a mini barrel country dairy. They're going to be like the Pepsi of Coca-Cola. It was going to be the, like the uh, KFC. Uh, but then they want to go into like uh, Dairy Queen. And um, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, you went out and tried to close the National General deal. I did. Uh, I was first uh, instructed to go to New York. And I got to New York and they said, no, you need to go to California. So I went out to California, got the deal done, got the, uh, the big the issue was, got, well, I don't remember the exact price, but it was a good price far above the market at that time. And you were, uh, uh, the big problem was deciding, wait the next day uh, and, and get a certified funds or wired funds. Instead, I took the check, just a regular check from National General for the millions of dollars it was. Flew back to Nashville and um, lost my luggage on the way, but I got back and we lived in a little house in Nashville on Page Road. And I reminded my wife that we'd probably be the only time in our life we'd be sleeping on top of a briefcase that had a check for X number of dollars. <laughs> 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 so we got it done and uh, Mr. Yeah. barely said, well, he said thank you. Was there um, very much fried chicken being made by many No, that was my chicken. issue. I kept saying, when are we going to uh, sell some chicken? Oh, we're getting to that. They were selling a lot of franchises, and there were a lot of people well-known in this town that uh, uh, were buying rights to the franchise. And it uh, had a good concept, um, just uh, didn't sell a lot of chicken. What finally happened after a couple of years working there? Well, we were asked to form a new company called, I think it was uh, Corporate Concepts, and they were going to be one of those uh, companies that was going to buy franchises from the company to uh, do the country dairy type program. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we got one started, and it was a main one we had over in East Nashville, and uh, it's now a Xerox store, I believe. <laughs> so the company basically closed down. Yes, yes, it did. This and would be in about, what, George, 1972, roughly? Close to that area, yeah. And that, it, we did have, we had started... Uh, another business in that company. And we had dealt with a fellow named Jess Nix with Greyhound, Profit Foods, a division of Greyhound. And it involved the Polly Davis Cafeterias. I've got to tell you about that. Polly Davis Cafeterias, they were located in Miami. And they were uh, in bankruptcy. So about that time, this is just a quick side story there. My second child was about to be born, and my wife told me I had to come back to, or else. You know, So I got back, but I had to file something with the court. And back then, it was very simplistic. And I gave my father what I'd written up to hand to the clerk of that judge. And we bought, we bought the uh, Polytheus cafeterias. And then that was, uh, then I was offered a position, I'm not getting ahead of it, but the position of offer. Well, I was going to ask you about that. After um, your stay at Mini Pearl Fried Chicken, and after that ended, I guess, in about um, 1972, where did you uh, Where did you go there? Well, a good old friend from mine from way back when was Bob Brandt, and he was working with a firm, law firm, Schumann, McCarley, Hollins, and Pride. And um, he said they're looking for somebody to come in and work here. Well, I took a big cut, but went there, rode the bus, and um, learned a lot about real estate through Mr. Schumann. Tell us about kind of who the lawyers were and what type of practice that firm had. It was an interesting, it was so, almost not a partnership, it was like an association. <coughs> and the lawyers were Isidore Schoeman, uh, 
T.T. McCarley, who did primarily subrogation work and uh, <laughs> uh, insurance claims work for um, the various insurance companies, Lewis Pride, uh, and Wayne Leroy, and John Hollins. Uh, in that group, eventually, while I was there, George Payne was there, uh, Carter Conway, Wayne Leroy, and then uh, Brant was there, but then he left and went, I think, to work for George Barrett, I believe, at that time. And then George Payne came in who was quite, quite a character. You would not know he was ever a judge if you saw his antics he pulled. <laughs> he later became a bankruptcy judge here. In yes, he did. And right. recently retired. Right, right. George, um, when you worked with Mr. Shulman during the couple of years that you were at the Sherman uh, uh, McCarley. Shulman and McCarley. Yeah. Shulman and McCarley firm, you began working in real estate. Yes. and. Schumann taught me a lot, but he worked very closely with the old republics, and the person there at that time was John Cobb. And, and between those two, whatever real estate I learned up to that time had been very little, but with them I did learn more. Well, you must have learned well because you pretty much made a career of it. Uh, well, that and the corporate transactions yeah. work, yeah. Um, it was, it's interesting in seeing how it's all evolved, and, um, um, but I was grateful for the opportunity. In about um, 1974, did you make a change? Yes, uh, a fellow had been in law school, two people had been in law school with me at Vanderbilt were Howard Liebengood and Fred Dalton Thompson. And they had Where was Fred from? Fred was from Lawrence County. Howard was okay. from Indiana. All right. But uh, they had been asked, as most people know, to work with Senator Baker on the Watergate investigation and the Watergate hearings. Howard became a counsel for the, uh, the, I guess it would be the Republicans, and Liebinger was a specialist. He had a lot to do with the role of the intelligence community in the CIA and the break-in. And so when they came back, somehow they had my name and said, you need to come and uh, talk to him about forming a law firm. And, uh, and they had been in Washington, D.C., working with Senator Howard Baker. Yes. And... Uh, Fred had, both of them had worked in Nashville before they went up there. Uh, I can't remember where Fred, I know Fred was with some lawyers that was more of an association. Mm -hmm. And he'd also been, a, I think, assistant DA at one time. I believe that's right. Leaving Good had worked with Jim Niels for him. And um, so they came back and they were told to contact me. And so we met and it's all history. It, was, it ended up being Thompson, Leaving Good, and Crawford. Where were your offices? At that time, they were in the First American Center, and we took over some space. I cannot remember the lawyer's name, but he had passed away, and uh, so they wanted to get out of the lease, and we, we took, took that space in the First American Center. And what type, of, what type of work did the firm do, and what was your part in the work? Well, we did whatever it came in the door at that time, but we folks, was, of course, Fred was involved in litigation, and um, I was non-litigation. And then we also did um, uh, real estate and then corporate work. And we had some firms who were very helpful to me. Uh, when they had conflicts, they sent that business to me. Uh, it, it was Mr. Bill Berry of Best Berry and Sims and then James Gooch. And that kept us going. And then, as I had mentioned when we were talking, Howard Leamgood decided to go back and work full time for Senator Baker, who at that time was minority leader in the Senate, when he became Majority Leader Howard stepped in the position of Sergeant at Arms, which I didn't know much about, but it was a very powerful position on the Hill. And uh, he made a career of that, and then he went into, uh, he went off the um, Senate uh, payroll and went into private sector and did very well. And then he came back with, when Fred was uh, elected Senator, he became his uh, right-hand person, and the same thing with Bill Fritz. And uh, I then, moved on after that, after a while. Well, I guess for the next 20 years, if you needed to contact somebody in the Senate, you had an inside we group. We did have an inside group. We did, and it was, it was very helpful from time to time. Um, and we opened an office, matter of fact, in Washington. Uh, Fred and I did. How long did the, um, did the remaining Thompson and Crawford firm continue? Yeah, we, we were together about eight years. And he, he got into the movies, and there really weren't any parts for me, so then I had to find another place to work. <laughs> <laughs> Would that have been about 1982? That, yeah, uh, yeah, something uh, like that. Uh, and I actually worked for a firm that 
reconnecting with some folks. So I was, I was Bone and Woods, and I came in with them, and then uh, eventually left them, um, and came to the Shulman. I mean, to the uh, Gullet Sanford firm, in 1984. Just briefly, um, while you worked at Bone and Woods, where was their office? Well, we ended up being in the same building, which is the old. I guess it was an old hotel. I believe that's right. And um, we were there with um, with uh, with uh, their bank, the U.S. Bank, I think it was. Right. And then I think U.S. Bank had some problems, and the, the firm sort of closed down. Yeah, uh, it had to be. Obviously, that was a major client, and we stayed for a while, and then uh, made a decision to come to the, uh, the Gullet firm. 1984, I believe. And I may be off on these dates a little bit, but right. I think that's close. And that's the firm you've now stayed with for golly. Well, it's been 30, 30 years, years at least, yeah. Uh, and I'm now the oldest person in the law firm. <laughs> <laughs> George, tell us what Gullet, Sanford, Robinson, and Martin was like during the first few years that you worked Well, there. it was interesting because when I came, I, I don't remember exact number, but it was about 12 lawyers. And I remember asking uh, Mr. Sanford and Mr. Robinson, uh, did they want this firm to last another generation? They said yes. So uh, they had been talking to some folks, and then I was asked, I was asked if I could go back and talk to them myself. And one of those was uh, Ray Busey and his group, and uh, we were able to work that out uh, thanks to the uh, Joe Martin being with uh, Ray Busey and that group. But also thanks to uh, Jack, Jack Senior and Mr. Go, uh, Mr. Gullet and Mr. Sanford, letting this happen, and thank goodness they did because when they came in a year later, we went into a deep recession, and Ray, as you know, in that group uh, do insolvency work and did very well in that group. So we got that involved, that group involved, and, and that in. was. That was who were the lawyers now that came in with um, the old co from the old Cochran firm. Yeah, it was Martin firm. and Cochran firm. Well, Joe Martin, of course, came in, and the name of the law firm was changed to Gullet, Sanford, Robinson, and Martin. And then Ray Busey, Tad Harris, uh, uh, Tom Forrester, Linda Knight, and I'm, I can't remember anybody else, but they were excellent people to come in and did a wonderful job and gave the diversity to the firm that it needed. And they were experts, I take it, in, in um, business. Uh, in so, uh, yeah, Chapter 11s and in, insolvency, that sort of thing, re reorganizations and that sort of thing. Exactly. And they're still, still doing it and doing a very good job, obviously. And then? Well, what? Uh, go ahead and follow up on what happened with the firm and what well, you Well, fortunately, they were, uh, the senior partners at that time were very amenable to um, broadening the base. Of, uh, of the clients for the firm, and one of those happened to be Gareth Aiden and Scott Derrick, and they came, and it's all history now. They had um, some wonderful clients, and they had brought some uh, additional diversity to the firm in litigation, and um, as we now know, the litigation group is doing very, very well and doing good work for some very good clients. And then, of course, we have managing partners, and then eventually, I followed Ray Busey in the managing partner, and uh, we have, and since that time, have brought some more folks in. And then, when I, after 11 years, I think everybody agreed, and I'd certainly agree with them that I didn't need to be managing partner any longer. And Scott Derrick came in and has done an excellent job. He's a completely different type of personality, but um, has done an excellent job. And so the firm is as healthy as it's been since I've been here. You mentioned that you were the managing partner for 11 years. Yeah. To put us into kind of context, would that be roughly from uh, uh, 2000 to about 2010 or 11? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, it's uh, the interesting thing about it is uh, until you do that, nobody ever knows what you really do. But in a, from our size, you not only have to be managing partner, but you also have to practice law. And in the larger firms, the managing partner does only that usually so it was a it was a challenging time but um, we, we modernized the firm as best we could and I have to give credit to the the senior partners at that time especially Jack Robinson and Val Sanford they were willing to let some of those young Turks try and do some things and uh, they were very supportive and as a result we've done very well when you first joined the office um, way back in 1984 
approximately how many attorneys were working at the office? I want to say about 12, if I remember correctly. I don't right. think it was much more than that. Um, and it was, uh, the major client was MedFed, very large percentage. It scared me to death because I thought they were going to be bought. Well, they ended up not making it. So fortunately, by the time they did not make it, they were only about uh, half of what they had been before. <coughs> and so we had to go through that process of growing the firm and your group and, and Scott's group certainly helped diversify the firm and put less stress and pressure on the firm to be with one or two clients, had very good clients. So in, in, in roughly the 30 years that you have worked at Gullet Sanford, it has basically grown about three times as large as it was. That's about originally. right, I think so. And a lot of young folks here and uh, all very bright, very bright and very professional. And uh, it, they've been a real plus. And um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about how the firm or how the parts of the firm got put together and, and how it operates. Yeah, I can't remember exactly, but it may have started with uh, Jack Robinson, and he was managing partner. And they decided to emphasize certain groups. Of course, there was litigation, there was insolvency, there was wills and estate or probate work, and then real estate and corporate. And um, all those areas of, um, had very good years overall. The litigation is done extremely well. Uh, the probate is, as you know, the, the book for lawyers was written by originally Jack Robinson and some other partners here. And it's, I believe it's still used by these folks. Uh, and they do a lot of estate work, a lot of estate planning. And then the uh, real estate, of course, West Turner heads up that department has done extremely well. And we've been able to get some good bases of clients. And th so that's that section. At the corporate area, Alan Lentz has sort of heads that up, and that's been um, interesting to see how that's evolved. Um, we are usually under the, uh, under uh, I would say, not recognized as being a corporate law firm, although we do have it, and we do transaction work, and we have done some private placement work over the years. Uh, usually, we know we can't compete with the big firms doing the IPOs and stuff, but we do these private placements and try to find our niche there. So we, I think we've found um, a good basis for all those sections, but a lot of, of course, is dictated by the economy. Right. And so it does ebb and flow, but fortunately because of the diversity, uh, diversity of, of income and clients, uh, we don't um, have the worries that some of them do. And I think that over roughly the last 10 years, they started a new group, which was an entirely new area of practice for the firm in um, in public life. Yeah, co uh, government relations. Yeah. What happened was we, uh, we were approached when we were managing partner on a couple of folks that had been doing uh, lobbying work, so to speak, or government relations work within a company. And they had decided they wanted to branch out and go into the legal work. And we were fortunate able to get um, Dan Haskell. And then he brought in Matt Scanlon, and uh, they've done an excellent job and uh, do well. And it's been delightful to see how they've worked, and they get a lot of repeat business. And uh, so that's worked well. And um, uh, we haven't gone into some areas that we had thought about going into, but um, if we find the right people to, to come in with some business, we may evolve into that work as well. Give us a little historical sketch on your work at the Gullet Sanford firm in terms of what type of work you've done, who you've worked with, and how that's gone. Well, I've done, of course, done real estate work. I've done corporate work. I've spent more time in the real estate area lately, although we're seeing that change some. Um, uh, fortunately, as I've said all along, it was very fortunate for me to have the, the talent that was here to help with the work. And then they have gotten their own practice going and doing very well. Um, we are seeing some changes. Um, the Job Act is going to have some changes in, in the residential area. It will not affect the commercial area, but we're, we're doing more and more commercial work. And we have some very bright young people that are get, helping get that work done. Um, but uh, fortunately, we've had good leadership. And we, the good thing about it, I think, at this firm, without going into a lot of details, there's not much of an ego here by lawyers. Lawyers all have some ego, but fortunately, they 
if they have an ego, they put that aside to, to do everything for the betterment of the firm. Tell us a little bit about your works um, in the community. Well, we've been fortunate that way. It, it, um, we've had opportunities. One of them uh, was uh, as a result of my first wife, who uh, was very involved at Children's Hospital. And matter of fact, the new hospital part of it is named in her memory. It's the Outpatient Resource Center for the youth and the kids there. And they have a one room where it says, no parent permitted in this room without the accompaniment of a child. And it's got computers and they, they can learn about their illness and that sort of thing. So I follow <coughs> that. Once she passed away, I've continued to be supportive of that, uh, of that of that group, the hospital there. I'm on the Camby Robinson board, which is uh, deals with the medical students that are going to Vanderbilt and helping with their programs for uh, interviewing them, but also uh, helping decide in a small way uh, who's going to get scholarships, and um, that's been good. I've been involved with Martha O'Brien, which is a, a, a group that is nonprofit and do they do a lot of work over in East Nashville and have done an extremely good job with the staff they have there to help get kids educated so they can go on to college. Even also help the, the elderly who have not been educated, not had job experiences, helping them get us at, uh, with that uh, program, helping them get jobs and help them be participants in the community. Um, one of my favorites was when we were, when I was managing partner, we were approached by a downtown partnership set up by Tom Turner to, uh, consider moving to this building, or at least staying downtown, because we were thinking, as you recall, of moving out to another office. And fortunately, we were able to work it out to stay downtown. And then we got involved with that and were asked to be uh, the chairman of the board for one year. And what they have done is remarkable. They have one of the best staffs I've ever seen, is they've encouraged people to work downtown, live downtown, and invest downtown. That's their model. And give you how well they're doing, you can see what's happened downtown. They've had a lot to do with helping the, the, the community and the city bring new business in. And then we have a lot of people living downtown that never would have been here when you and I were growing up here or first starting to be here. Well, I've always <coughs> considered that to be one of your greatest accomplishments through the downtown partnership because I can remember 15 years ago, nobody was living downtown. Right. Right. And now look what we have. Well, and I attribute that to, the, to that staff that they have. It's, it's one of the best staffs I've ever seen. But uh, the young people who come to Nashville as opposed to going to Atlanta or Charlotte or some other places, they have brought their ideas and encouraged these ideas to modernize the city in the living downtown. So the living work and investing downtown, uh, it's been uh, uh, possible to get done because these, these young people have an idea of being close to where they work. And um, as you can see, we, we're doing well. The only problem is we've got to make sure we get a, a traffic flow better. <laughs> and fortunately, the, the new mayor says that's one of her main things besides education. That'll be a tough one. Yeah. Let's loop back, if you don't mind, for just a minute and um, kind of go back to your personal and family life because you mentioned something a moment ago that I think is important. I believe that um, after a long illness, your wife Judy passed away yes. in about 2001. Yes. Um, what had happened there? Well, she had been diagnosed with breast cancer at age 35 and was given only two years to live by the original thing. Well, for various reasons, she was able to live with it for uh, 23 years. Um, it was it was tough at the time because we were both young. She was 35 and I was 37. And the last thing I thought about, and I'm sure she thought about it, of coming down with cancer. Well, she took it and made it positive. And uh, she kept active in the community. And uh, she set a wonderful example, as I've reminded some of her relatives, that uh, she found something good in everybody. And thank goodness she did, for all our sakes. And, uh, but anyway, being that as May, she, uh, she did a lot for the Children's Hospital. As I mentioned, part of this hospital is named in her memory, the Flying Pig. Um, she, uh, she was a wonderful wife and a wonderful parent, and both of our kids have uh, excelled in whatever they've taken on and doing, and I attribute a lot of that to her. Tell us about your children, just briefly. Well, my oldest is Ellen. Um, 
she worked in the law firm for us during the summer, and I said, you think you want to be a lawyer? And she said, no, I don't want to be around those egotistical men. So she went on to go to Davidson, did well there, and then decided uh, before my wife passed away, she wanted to go to seminary. And so she had to go into Union Theological Seminary in Richmond to be a minister. And as a result of that, she has made a, a career of that. Her husband is also a minister, but also a professor. They have one child. And they right now live in uh, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, where she has her own church. So she's doing well. And the community she lives in reminds me of a Rockwell picture because the kids all walk to school on the sidewalk. The dogs follow. Even the cats come out and look at them walking down the street. So it's, it's a very wonderful, healthy uh, situation. My son, George, is a lawyer. Uh, he went to... Oh, that's George Crawford, Jr. He's the thir third. third. Yeah, he's the third. And um, um, he's... Before he went into law school, we encouraged him to go work in firms. Of course, he got to work with a big firm in Atlanta, Austin and Berg, through the help of some of our friends. And, and he was one of those 1,000 case clerks they had there. So he saw how a big firm worked, came back here, and went to UT Law School, did, did fine, re, re, uh, got married. And they live here with um, two boys, um, delightful young men. And, um, and his wife's excellent, another strong woman. And he's now with the Butler Snow Firm. I think he's doing well there, and um, I'm trying not to embarrass him as a father. You know, that's what I'm supposed to not do, is not embarrass him. I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, do you have grandchildren? You do. We have, um, I have three. George has two boys, and my daughter Ellen has one little girl. She lost one right after Judy died, but uh, they're all doing well and healthy. And... Um, they call me Big G. I've never been called Big, so they call me Big G. You know, recently, um, I think that you told me that um, <coughs> after Judy passed away, that you got a call from an old friend of yours from right. high school. Right. That's Tell us about that. Well, what happened was we were down in Miami where my father still lives. My mother has passed away, and uh, at the time he was living. He was 90 years old, and so we were going to celebrate his birthday by taking him sailing. We were always big sailors. So we took him out on one of these boats that, that he had raced on called the Comanche. And um, the, the friends of ours owned the boat, uh, called my current wife, and said that I was in town. So she called me, asked me to meet her down at the yacht club to catch up with things. And so I said, well, I don't have a car. I'd be on the car for the kids to celebrate you know, being free, and I was going to babysit at that time one grandchild. So I had to go back to the kids and say, can I borrow your car? I need to, I need to borrow because I won't be out late. Reverse rules. And so that's when Linda and I met. We'd never dated. We, our families knew each other well. Her husband had passed away a year before Judy did. And um, so and one thing led to another. We got buried, and um, all I know is she's another strong woman, and uh, I just say yes, dear. But uh, she's a very talented person, plays the organ, the piano. Um, actually does carpentry work, which is great, and um, um, likes, the, likes the mountains. She loves being over there in North Carolina where you all go, and uh, we have a place up there now. And so she, uh, we saw a picture of ourselves when I was president of student body. She, I guess, had to invite me to this function of her club, and we don't look, and the picture shows us not looking very happy. So, <laughs> so we've come a long way, but we're doing fine, and she has six grandchildren. For the um, for the record, George, what um, what was Linda's name before you married? Uh, well, her her maiden name was Walters. Her uh, married name was Wellenhofer, John Wellenhofer. I did not really know him, but they but they met in Florida and got married. I have two delightful kids and six wonderful grandchildren. They're just uh, very 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 good people. George Tefilli kind of finalized what we've talked about over the years. What things in practice do you think um, um, make a good lawyer? What, what is it that helps a person be a successful lawyer? That's a, it's hard to answer. It may vary from one person to the other. Obviously, there are some very bright people that practice law. What I have found is that it's not an easy way to make a living. You have to work hard. You're nine to five idea is not going to happen unless you've got an unusual practice. Um, what I have found and what has made me feel very comfortable here at um, Gullet is these folks are very professional, very bright, and very ethical. 
as I say, we may not be the richest people in town, we're not the poorest, but uh, what I found to be very important, and I saw it here, that uh, you didn't have to worry what they were doing outside the office. They were doing a good job at the office and uh, doing the right things and doing things in the community. But the main thing is their professionalism, their ethics, and um, their camaraderie. I don't think, I've mentioned before, I don't think there's any real egotistical problem here. We all are lawyers, we have an ego. But the main thing is that they're for the firm. And thanks to the leadership going way back when, they set the right tone for this law, this law firm being professional. We've had, as you know, we've had opportunities to merge with some bigger firms. And when I was managing partner, uh, I said, it's up to you all what you want to do. And they decided they didn't want to merge with the big firms. They may happen in the future, but right now it seems to be going well, and um, I'm grateful to be a part of it and hope they'll let me stay a little while longer. You know, you mentioned to me, just to finish up, that uh, that the, the gold standard when you began practice or even came to this firm had always been that being a lawyer was a profession. Right. But I think you mentioned that you'd learned that you also have to have to temper that with good business judgment. Right. And we've been very fortunate that the leadership and the lawyers as a whole have been very professional, no question about that, but also they're cognizant of, um, of it being a business. Um, I won't mention names, but there were some people who used to look at the checkbook each day, and I thought, well, if it's not a business, why are you looking at the checkbook? But the main thing is that it's still at the, still the factor I think that's important that we are in a business, but we do not need to forget what we are as a professional uh, practice. Uh, do you, do, um, do you and Linda get a chance to travel any? Well, we, we did take one trip uh, recently to Alaska, and I talked to you about it, and it was one of the most fascinating trips I've ever had. Uh, uh, I have traveled from the business standpoint with the ABA and this sort of thing, and I was a part of a group of lawyers and an international group that would lecture on certain things. But this was a strictly pleasure, and um, fascinated by the, the, the state, fascinated by people who live there. And we talk about living through the tough times. Some of those people have lived through the tough times, as you know. But I got to see a lot of the wildlife. Uh, my biggest problem is when I was trying to take pictures of the whales, I usually got them as they're going in down rather than up. <laughs> so, but it was beautiful, beautiful country and uh, a, a real design. We did it through Vanderbilt. They had a program, and so we got to go on that on a smaller boat so we'd get back up into all sorts of inlets. Well, you've had, a, you've had uh, obviously a fascinating career, and you're still practicing? Trying to. Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been a delight. I was grateful to get the opportunity to come to law school at Vanderbilt and, and practice law in Nashville. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Yeah. We're grateful to you for taking the time to share your oral history in, in the bar and during your life. It, uh, we're very thankful for that. Thank you, George, very much. Thank you.